Welcome to Better Life Television, uh, Better Life Today. My very special guest today is an American citizen. She has lived in America for many years, but she originally is from Romania. Welcome to my very special friend, Elena Bourjour. Elena, welcome. Thank you very much for having me here today. I'm, I'm happy to have you here. You have such a story to tell. God has been so good to you throughout your life, and I'm anxious to hear your story. Uh, how long have you lived in the United States? Uh, I lived here for uh, 34 years. 34 years. I came in America in uh, 1987. Okay, okay. I want to, um, there's several things I hope that we can get in, uh, but I am very curious, and I know that our viewers will enjoy hearing about what it was like to live in a communist regime. Tell me about that. Well, I have been here uh, half of my life in America, so I need to go back in time yeah. and uh, try to remember how life was like in Romania during communism. Uh, anyway, I was just a little girl when the communism took over in Romania. Uh, I don't have uh, a lot of memories from my childhood, except the fact that I went hungry many times. Mm. And when I was uh, meal time, my mom uh, was in tears and she was wondering what can I put on the table for my seven children. Mm -hmm. And this happened because uh, after the communism came in power, they came and confiscated our uh, uh, food, our uh, storage uh, reserves, mm -hmm. uh, and take them away because they wanted us to be equal with everybody else. And the, my family was considered above the, above the average. And they felt that we have too much and they need to take away our food reserves. And uh, they left us empty with our cupboards empty. And uh, our parents were crying and crying and said, what are we going to put on the table for our seven children? Mm. And I remember mealtime was a sad time. Mm -hmm. And we did not really enjoy as children meal time because there was so little food on the table and a lot of times I remember daddy would refrain from eating just to have enough food for his children. My word. Where would they get the food and, and what would you eat on those very lean times? Well, bread was not there. We longed for a, a loaf of bread. And uh, if we were lucky enough, we had bread only for Sabbath mm -hmm. and only a slice of bread for children only. Parents did not have the bread on the table. Mm -hmm. And basically potatoes and beans and uh, our parents grew a little garden in the backyard. And in summertime it was a happy time with, because we can harvest our own tomatoes and cucumbers and mm -hmm. uh, have a little bit more. What was it like to be an Adventist in communist Ro Ro Romania? I felt uh, the frustration uh, as an Adventist when I went to school. In my first grade, I was seven at that time. And uh, even though I was very excited to go to school, I loved learning and uh, uh, I was excited to experience school on my own, even though I played school at home with my older siblings, but the teacher was very rude to me. From day one, he pointed to me uh, and explained to the other students in the classroom that Elena is an Adventist, she believes in God, and she's a crazy idiot little girl, mm -hmm. and she believes that there is a God up above in heaven, and he will come back and take her over there, and if that's true, I will cling on her leg and I will make it to heaven. And everybody was bursting in laughing and clapping hands and making fun of me, being an idiot 
child. Mm. And I was so embarrassed about that. I wanted to hide under the bench mm. because of that. So this was my first impact with school. It was a very sad day. The first day I almost didn't want to go to school again. Now the Bible tells us that one day every knee will bow That's right. and every tongue will confess right. that Jesus Christ is Lord. And someday that teacher will know that you were not the idiot child That's that right. he so right. gleefully proclaimed to the classroom. How old were you when that happened? Seven. Seven Only years seven. old. Wow. And even though I was uh, an outstanding student, uh, the teacher was always, uh, I felt that she tra treated me differently just because I believed in God. Mm. And she never said an word of appreciation or encouragement to me. She was always, you know, uh, blaming me for uh, being uh, mentally retarded and believing in God. And uh, once in a while, she will send me home and said, you are not allowed to come back until you convince your parents to sit, send you to school on Saturday. Mm. I want to mention that in Romania at that time, uh, uh, working with was from Monday through Saturday, and so we had classes on Saturday. Okay. It was mandatory. Wow. And I was sent home, I was crying, but I knew that it's not my parents that will uh, restrain me from going to school on Saturday. It was me because I was convinced that Sabbath is the day of the Lord, mm -hmm. and I'm supposed to be in church and not in the classroom on you, Saturday. You knew that as a very young Absolutely. girl? Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, you made it through grade school. Did you go to high school? I went to high school. It was always a struggle, mm -hmm. but through God's grace, I managed to go through high school and graduate. And uh, from my friend's experience, I knew that going to college or university would be the most challenging thing mm -hmm. because uh, attendance was very uh, strict and you cannot miss classes and um, uh, it was not mandatory though. So if you choose not to come to classes on Saturday, you are free to just quit mm -hmm. and do something else. Mm -hmm. But my hunger for learning uh, was exceedingly uh, high and I wanted to go to school. I wanted to become a doctor, mm -hmm. but I needed to be in school for six years. And I knew that my parents would not be able to uh, uh, support me for that long period of time, and uh, I decided to go to a medical college instead. Mm. And uh, I was able to uh, keep the Sabbath in a very, very amazing way, just because the Lord opened doors for me to uh, be absolved for not coming to school on Saturday, even having a, a free Saturday for a whole uh, semester, yeah. for lack of having a classroom for my, my uh, Class. Amazing. Yeah. It has been, Elena, by the way, is writing a book about her experience, and it has been my privilege to read it. It's not in publication yet, mm -hmm. but soon, by God's grace, uh, we'll be able to talk about the book. But um, I know that you spelled out your experience of going to class and, uh, and, and how many times you were able and given the grace to not attend on Sabbath. Right. Wonderful. Yeah. What did you do for fun in Romania? Did you have hobbies? Did you have friends? Uh, tell me a typical, maybe a weeknight or something that you would do for fun. Yeah, we, uh, we were very uh, united in church. We had a very good group of youth, children, youth. And uh, we went out, you know, camping, hiking in the mountains. Romania, it's beautiful. Mm. It's a beautiful country. And we always escaped from the city in the country, in the mountains, uh, on the uh, Black Sea shore. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have gorgeous nature in Romania. And we have always been tempted to go out and escape from the atmosphere of the city and go out in nature. And yeah. hiking was one of my favorite hobbies. Wow. And you still walk today. Absolutely. You and every your day. Emil. Every, yeah. Even this morning, even yeah. though I had a short time <laughs> to get ready for this a program, I still went in the park for a walk. Wonderful. Well, in the second half, we are going to talk about um, a miracle that you've witnessed through your son. Yes. But let's back up a bit and, and tell me about um, the time that you had your son and, and how, you know, where that was and how old you were. I was 
on my 30s uh, when I married. And uh, of course, as a, any young woman, I wanted to become a mother. Yeah. And uh, uh, due to a medical condition, a surgery that needed to be performed uh, even before I married, uh, I was left after surgery with uh, a scar tissue on my uterus. And the doctor told me that I will not be able to have children. Mm -hmm. And I did not believe that. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, because I wanted to become a mother, God honored my desire. Mm -hmm. And three months after I got married, I got pregnant. Oh. I went back to the doctor and said, you are a naive child. <laughs> you don't realize what you are talking about. It's impossible. And yet, God proved to be a God of impossible. So your doctor called you naive, exactly. and yet you were able to prove. And even he yeah. wanted to uh, uh, interrupt the, the pregnancy, and uh, uh, because he said, you, you cannot carry on the baby because you have a, uh, a scar tissue that will not expand, and uh, uh, you'll have a uh, natural abortion anyway. Mm. And I said, I will allow that baby to stay there because God planted that baby in my uterus. And I will keep it as long as God wants me to keep it. And I Amen. carry on the pregnancy with no problems until the term. Oh. And a baby boy came in the world. We named him Silvio. Mm. And what day and year was that? It was May 6th, 1980. 1980, wonderful. And did you have other children or is he the only no, child? No, this is the only a child uh, God gave me. And unfortunately, uh, I need to mention that three years after, uh, I became a single mother. Mm. My, my son's father decided to move away mm. and start uh, a new lifestyle and uh, enjoy the freedom of the world, he mm. said. And uh, I ended up in being uh, a single mother. I suffered a very, very severe uh, emotional trauma. Yeah. And, uh, but God helped me to go through uh, this uh, period of seven years being a single mother. Mm -hmm. And I play a double role to be a mother for my baby boy and to, be, to play a father as much as I could. Yeah, and he did bless in that way. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, when we come back, we are going to talk about um, your son, um, what was his condition? What was he diagnosed with? Well, he was a very healthy boy until the age of five. And uh, all of the sudden, we realized that he has problem with his left leg. It was swelling up and was very painful, red and tender and high fever. We rushed him to the hospital and the doctors were amazed that this boy was brought to the hospital too late. They said this mm -hmm. boy must be ill for at least three weeks. Why did you bring him sooner? And I said, we had no clue. He was running his bike, he was playing, he was a happy boy. He didn't give us any clue that he will have a leg problem mm -hmm. until that very day when we rushed him to the hospital. My goodness. Well, Elena, your story reminds me of a, a quote out of Psalms, Psalms 121.8. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. He has been so Amen. faithful. Amen. Well, on the other side of this break, we are going to learn more of the story of Elena's son, the miraculous healing that God provided, and not just a miracle that Elena could witness, but the doctors and nurses that were caring for him as well. Please stay tuned. We'll have more right after this. Better Life Broadcasting is a viewer-supported Christian media ministry that offers streaming programming via apps on various devices. Please visit blbn.org to support Better Life or to get more information. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Welcome back to Better Life Today. My guest is Elena Bourjour. She is an American citizen, but hails from Romania. And as we took our break, we were talking a little bit about your son. So we know at five years old, up to that point, he was a healthy child, uh, riding his bike, running. But tell us again what happened. Well, um, all of a sudden, he started complaining about severe pain in his left leg. 
And we noticed that his leg was swelling up fast and reddish and very, very tender. I couldn't even touch with my finger his leg. He was running high fever and we decided to rush him to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And then the doctor said, how come you are a medical professional? How could you dare to keep your son in such condition for three weeks? It seems that he has been infected for at least three weeks. And they could not believe when I told them that we did not have any clue, any signs mm -hmm. that my son got an infected leg. Mm -hmm. And they needed to uh, run lab tests, x-rays, and the diagnosis came up. And it was devastating for me when the doctor said there is no hope for your son to survive until tomorrow. Wow. He's not going to make it until the they, morning. They gave him 24 hours or less to or live. Or less. Even what was less. the diagnosis? What did they say was They wrong? found out that he got a staph infection inside the bone marrow. Mm. which is a deadly infection, especially for young patients like my son. Mm. And they said that they will try their best, and they took him to the surgical room, removed a, a, a ball of pus from his leg, sutured the incision back, brought him back in the room, in the ICU, and uh, they said, we need to watch his vital signs, bring your family together, because he's not going to make it until morning. Mm. High fever, his tachycardia was over 200. And he was just vibrating. The bed was vibrating when he was breathing in and out. And he, uh, he was in a lot of pain. And uh, the doctor said that nothing can be done. And wow. the surgeon said, I'm not God to save your child. Mm. Did you say his heart was beating at about 200 beats a minute? 210 My times, word. yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, the surgeon may not have been God, but you had a Absolutely. connection with God. Well, what happened then? You're by his bedside. It's was this the very first day that you had taken yes, him in? Yes. Yes. Okay. We uh, I had only my brother with me overnight. And uh, uh, we watched and pray over the the baby dying bed, and uh, I did call the pastor of our church and ask him to uh, call the whole co church for prayer mm. for this little baby mm. that will not make it unless God will intervene. Mm. And I knew that God has the power. He's the source of life. Mm. And I was confident that if it's his will, my son is going to make it. Mm -hmm. And we prayed and prayed, and I said, Lord, this is the only thing I have. This is the most precious gift you gave me. Please don't take my baby away. Mm. My life is a nonsense if the baby will not be with me. Yeah. And in God's mercy, my son kept on breathing all night. And in the morning, when the doctors came back, for this, their morning routine. It was a large crew of doctors, surgeons, residents, all kinds of specialists, heart specialists, liver specialists. They were astonished to look at the baby. He was still breathing on his own. Of course, with the oxygen mask yeah. and the IV and uh, antibiotics you know, pumping on his IV nonstop. They did blood transfusion on him also to uh, refresh his blood and give him healthy blood. Yeah. And, uh, but even though he survived overnight, they, the doctors did not give me hope. They said, it seems that uh, his situation becomes more complicated with every hour is passing by. And uh, because his condition was aggravated, they ran again different tests and found out that the infection has spread in the whole body and he became septic. Mm. And they said that with this type of septicemia, there is no way we can keep him alive. Mm -hmm. Every single organ was infected, was filled up with pus. His lungs were so filled up, they showed me on the x-ray, it was only one-tenth of his 
lung that was still functioning. Oh and his heart was wrapped in pus. They said it's damaged worse than a massive heart attack. My. And they said there is no way he's going to make it. Five and years old. Five years old. Mm. And I kept on praying and I looked up to heaven and I said, Lord, we know that you have the power to save. Mm. You brought him to life. His birth is a miracle. He's con he was conceived in a very miraculous way. And I know that you, Lord, can keep him alive just for your glory and for the joy of his mother and mm. for the whole family. Mm. And he did not die, but he did not get any better. Mm. And we spent three, no, two months in an intensive care unit in, wow. unit in the hospital, mm. up and down, up and down. And the doctors could not give up on him because he, they noticed that I'm very confident. And when they look at me and my uh, bright, uh, shiny face, they said, what's the matter? Look at the uh, patient chart, look at his um, uh, clinical data, and it seems that he's already dead, but the baby is still breathing, and look at his mother's face, mm -hmm. shining peacefully, mm -hmm. you know, staying connected with the Lord. Yes. And eventually they told me, we could not give up on this patient just because of you, because you will not give up on him. Mm -hmm. Because you wouldn't give up, they're not going to give That's up. That's right. What a wonderful and, story. And after, after about a month, they said, we ran out of any medication uh, on the Romanian market. We need something else because the body got used to this, you know, the mutation mm -hmm. happened and the staff is still there. And uh, they said, it's any way uh, you can bring medication from America because they knew that I have uh, a family here in America. And uh, sure enough, my brother from America, Cornell, came in the country and brought a large dose of new generation of antibiotics that was pumped in his veins and for a week, no sign of recovery. But after a week, he started feeling better, and the lab test became better and better. And uh, now, we started to truly believe that he is going to survive. How did your brother get his hand on the medicine? Did he contact his doctor, or uh, you know what? Uh, we had friends uh, uh, in Loma Linda when we used to live, okay. uh, and. Uh, the doctors gave us, our Adventist doctors gave us sample antibiotics. Mm. Mm. That helped a lot. And even though my brother could not get his visa to enter in the country, he flew in Romania and he called me from the airport and he said, I was asked to bring evidence from the hospital that you need this medication right away. And I brought a paper from the hospital that this patient is dying and he's in a great need of antibiotics. And I went to the uh, airport, passed the paper to the officials over there, and they transferred the med uh, antibiotics from my brother to me. They will not allow him to come in. Mm. And you rushed back to the hospital. I rushed back to the <laughs> hospital. And uh, eventually, my brother show up the next day on the door in the, in the ICU mm. uh, room and I said, how come you are here? He said, well, <laughs> it's God. Yeah. You know, he paid a large sum of money and got his visa on the spot and he was able to, to get inside. Yeah. So after two months, you were able to leave the hospital? That's right. Okay. Yeah. And another challenge we had faced being away from the hospital, away from the nurses and doctors. And I was in the charge of monitoring his vital signs and so on. And it was a tough situation because I couldn't feed him naturally because he was fed on the IV for two months and they mm -hmm. said he might not recover because he will not be able to chew and swallow and because he lost his uh, reflexes, mastication mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, his stomach was not there anymore. On the x-ray, the stomach, is, there is no cavity anymore. Wow. But amazingly, with juicing and uh, prayers, uh, he uh, recuperated. A month later, we went back to the hospital and they said, wow, what did you pump in this little boy because he's very strong now, his, his blood tests are great, except the x-ray uh, exposed an infection that burst into the growth cartilage of the left uh, uh, tibia and damaged the growth cartilage 
and the doctor said, your boy will be crippled for the rest of his life because this bone is not going to grow anymore and it will become shorter and shorter and he will be crippled, limping on his left leg and uh, he's not going to recover because we cannot transplant uh, growth cartilage. Yeah, yeah. And they said the only hope for you will be to go to America you might have a chance to recuperate your son completely. Oh, what a wonderful story. And come to America, she did. In fact, we're going to have a second program with you. Thank you. So we invite you to watch for that. We're going to talk about how you were able to come to America and uh, how God continued to provide for you through different people and different circumstances for you and your son. It's just such an amazing story. Well, Elena, I've um, really enjoyed our talk, and we'll have more time next time. Would you leave, um, in fact, I want to I wanna read something um, from Psalms 28.2, and then I'm going to ask you to, to leave our viewers with a positive, inspirational message in your native tongue, if you would do that. But this is Psalm 28.2. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help when I lift up my hands toward your most holy sanctuary. And I thought that was such a fitting verse, yes. verse for what you went through at your son's yes. bedside, that yes. you cried to God for mercy, yes. and that you lifted your hands and your hearts up to him, and he That's heard right. you and answered you. That's right. Praise him. Amen. He's such a good father. Well, would you leave our viewers with an inspirational um, message in Romanian? Yes. Uh, I want to share with you uh, in Romanian for the Romanian viewers. I'll say, Bine ați venit. And și am să citesc din Proverbe, capitolul 3, versetul 5 și 6, uh, unul din versetele mele favorite. Încrede-te în Domnul din toată inima ta și nu te bizui pe înțelepciunea ta. Recunoaște-L în toate căile tale și El îți va netezi cărările. That's beautiful. Thank you. That is beautiful. What did you say? I said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Mm -hmm. And this is Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. It's beautiful and such a great way to live. Yeah. I am so grateful that the Lord perform amazing miracles in my life yeah. and kept my son alive. Mm -hmm. And we have all the reasons in the world to praise God we do. and glorify his name through all he has done for us. Yes. Well, Elena, thank you for being here today. It was my pleasure and my privilege. And thank you for watching today. And we just hope that through Elena's personal testimony, you've been blessed and you can know that we serve a mighty God a God that loves and cares for us and that is just waiting for you to, to look up to Him and, and cry out to Him. Don't be afraid to do that. This has been Better Life Today. We invite you to tune in next time. Have a wonderful day.